Okay, now introduce me. So I am Brett Thompson. <laughs> yeah, started spearfishing at 11, 31 now, so 20 years of spearfishing. Well, I started when I was four. I'm like 22 now, so that's 18 years of spearfishing and free day. So for Barracuda, I think the main thing is that they, a lot of times, quite curious, if you give them the time to become curious, they they might sometimes appear to be, you know, wanting to stay far, keep a certain distance, but they will always eventually come. So you just have to keep that in mind. A good tip is to try and uh, act as do you're not really that interested or like hide behind something and make them you know want to check you out instead of you know pointing your gun at them and looking straight at them and you know looking threatening you want to be sort of flat quiet and not really um posing any kind of threat and that goes for a lot a lot of other fish but it works quite well with barracudas I feel like you're leading me on to this question, why is? <laughs> uh, as a rule of thumb, you should never put your hand into the holes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you have to keep in mind that there could be things in, in caves and holes that could harm you. So, I mean, I wouldn't randomly shove my hand into a hole with trying to grab a lobster because uh, they have like more eels or sea urchins and fun stuff like that but you could stick your hand in a hole just be aware of the potential threats that or risk that exist inside those holes it's not recommended yeah i've been bitten by more eels twice before sticking my hands in holes it's not a pleasant experience at all you do not want to have fun to Watch it, you stop on the tail! I shot on the butt! My tail, stop on the Nah, not me and holes. From a hole? I mean, yeah, I'd go wrong, but keep a good lookout. Make sure and check every corner of the hole. Make sure to have no eel around, so... Before you go pushing. Yeah, you have a damaged fish in a hole, even if the... A lot of the times, even if like a moril or a nurse shark or something like that is not in the hole, they would find themselves there quite fast. It's not an uncommon mm -hmm. thing to see that. So, I mean, it's, it's as a sparrow, you want to be aware of just going into a hole is not something that you want to do. You want to assess the risk and make sure that it's safe to put your hand inside or it's safe to swim inside before you actually mm -hmm. go inside or put your hand inside. Keep an eye over your shoulder. It, it's you you want to minimize most of the times the, the visibility of your gun to sort of make it one with yourself and when you present it when you're ready to shoot as opposed to have it out you know swinging around and being shown so yeah for streamlining for sure it's just like, you know, when it is we free diving and you're holding your nose, you don't want your elbow all the way out here creating drag. You don't want your, your other arm or your gun out here creating drag. Everything has to be very streamlined. You know, you go on easier, you would, you know, um, make it all easier for yourself. Mm -hmm. okay, so pretty much you start off point any gun exactly where you want to go and you do your what would be a normal duck dive except the only difference would be where you do with your hands so you basically tuck 
towards where your gun pointing. You know, you lift your leg at the same time, and you have that other arm that reach in in line with the gun, and then pull in. And you sort of pull the handle of the gun back together. So it's kind of like a two-arm pull, except one hand is with the gun, and one ha- one hand one arm is with um is with just a, a bare hand. Especially with deep dives, yeah. Um, yeah, Kuberas are definitely... I'll rate them as the most challenging snapper that we have to hunt in Trinidad Spearfishing anyway. Um, just like a barracuda or just like any other fish just about presentation so you don't want to make yourself look threatening uh you want to get the fish to come to you most of the time kuberas do not stick around for a long time they are known to stay away and if you've ever seen a kubera on the water you know it does that thing where it kind of very rapidly swings to the side and it'll like it'll dart to the left or dart to the right and kuberas get significantly smarter with their size. I don't know if this is the same in Tobago, but in Trinidad, um, I'm sure it's, it seems to be the same in Tobago as well. But in Trinidad, once you cross that like 30 pound range, it gets very, very challenging to shoot those bigger fish. They stay away for sure. So yeah, presentation, get to the sea floor. Anything that you can get behind is definitely going to be a plus if you get behind it early. If you see a Kubera early, like as it's coming into you, um, you have the upper hand. If you see it late, you're probably not going to get to shoot it. Barracuda will probably give you a little bit more time to shoot it. So like you may get one, two or multiple drops to try to shoot a uh, Barracuda. You probably only get one drop to try to shoot a Kubera snap for. So you have to be somewhat assertive with the way that you hunt them. You don't want to be aggressive with how you stalk them, but you have to be assertive with taking the shot when you get it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's They definitely work, but to me is also one more thing that you have to worry about floating around in the water. And you have to kind of babysit it a lot of the time. Or you could just dive around it, but it definitely work. It's just sometimes it may not be necessary. But I would say for blue water hunting, where it's just out in the open and fish sort of floating freely, it's kind of present a, a something for for fish to sort of uh, um, school around in a way. Just give them a point of reference to sort of have something of interest to come. Otherwise, they, they're free to just float around the place. Because like I saw it first hand with, with Wahoo and Dolphin in Tobago South one like fads. And you would see them floating, like these wahoo floating far, 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 far out in the distance. And all there's like 100 foot vis. And for nothing, they wouldn't come close. And as soon as they drop a flash, uh, one by one, you would see them, you know, floating a little closer and actually checking it out. And for things like carries and kingfish, I saw it a lot. And even barracuda. That, you know, they would be passing, passing, passing. But if you have a flash, they would more than likely pass right by the flash area so they dive right around it. They work, yeah, but then it's just, again, one more thing you have to worry about in your water and you have to kind of babysit it. Yeah, flashes definitely work. I don't personally use them and they're not necessarily only effective on pelagics, but they're more geared towards pelagics. So it's just like mm-hmm. all these species that Saif just mentioned. My my Ipahu, king mackerel, Spanish mackerel. Um, if you're hunting steelfish, blue marlin, that kind of stuff, it will be probably a little bit more. Well, probably it is more effective on on those species. 
like I said, I, I don't person I've never personally used a flash show before. And I I've only hunted pelagics like a handful of times in my life. I do grunts all the time. Does it make a difference? It's I don't know. I feel see. like, yeah, I feel like maybe a small percent of the time it could. Um, I've found majority time it doesn't, but I mean, there's other people that say otherwise or have different personal experiences to that. Noises, are, I think noises can attract fish. Um, like I know scratching on rocks i've personally done that and seen that work but I've, I've seen that work more than actual grunting like i've scratched rocks and had like snappers come around or like mutton snappers um specifically i'm talking about they tend to come around when you kind of like scratch rocks on your ground and they also come around when you like you do that little sand kick up as well because they kind of come in to see what you're doing you're kind of curious well is there food for me there or you know What's that noise? Is something moving rocks? Could I get crustaceans? What's going on? So they kind of come in out of curiosity to see if there's probably some source of food for them. You go out there and dive. And I think a good thing for for beginners to do is when they go out and dive spearfishing is not to spearfish with the intent of trying to shoot as much fish as possible and just try to get practice pulling trigger and loading up fish. I think what a lot of people is overlook is sort of spear fishing with the intent of learning and getting better. So for example instead of you know loading up fish after fish you sort of go down there and observe what's going on. See how fish react to, to different movements and body language that you would do and then in that case now <laughs> you would find that you would get bigger fish come around and better quality fish as opposed to you know shooting constantly and it's reached a point away you know if you dive with the intent of learning and understanding the environment and the fish and their behavior the shooting part has become like nothing, not really that much of a problem. All fish will just come straight up to you. You know, if <clears throat> I might not be able to load up as much numbers as somebody else, but when it comes to hunting fish and getting fish to come close to you, I think, you know, it, it, it is a very um, important thing for beginners to learn that that art and skill of getting fish to come close and understanding what to do in certain situations. And just keep on diving and working on that with the intent of understanding that. Yeah, definitely. Good ad I think that's sound adv advice for sure. Um, a good mindset to start with is don't confuse shooting fish as progress. So because mm -hmm. you shot a fish, don't consider it progress. What, like, what Saif so just explained there with respect to yeah, learning, understanding fish patterns, understanding where fish are, why they're there, understanding sustainability, understanding the discipline of free diving and what a spare fisherman actually represents, which is selective fishing. And those are those are once you build that foundation, it's something good to move forward from, if that makes sense. Scientifically, if you want to use data, majority of life in the ocean is within your first hundred feet of water. So that goes worldwide. So to answer that question, I mean, less than a hundred feet, yeah, majority of the fish that you're going to find in the ocean is going to be there. And the fish that you're going to be targeting as a free diver is going to be less than a hundred feet. You're not gonna really need to venture outside of 100 feet too much. Majority of the world records are, I think, less than, I 
believe 60 feet where the majority of the wheel records are for fish. I believe so, if I'm not mistaken. Don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, the just like Saif mentioned, like certain parts of Trinidad, if you go in the Gulf, our Gulf, our deep parts of the Gulf is only 80 feet. And majority, if, if you could get the water clean, majority of the fish that people shoot in the Gulf are like between 10 to 30 feet of water. The water is just very dirty there, so you don't always, it's a little bit challenging when it comes to clarity to actually shoot fish. But if you go like on the East Coast, then you could target fish in a little bit deeper water. You're more hunting like six to eight, eight feet of water, and you're still going to find uh, abundance of fish in like that depth of water. The Trinidad doesn't drop off until quite far off the coast. So you could find three in the feet of water very, very quickly in Tobago. Whereas in Trinidad, it takes quite some time to find 300 feet of water unless you're in one of the channels, like in the first book or the second book. And ain't nobody going down in 300 feet of water. Anyway, yes. man, breath belly, anybody goes down past 60 feet on the islands because visibility down in Trinidad is like majority every time below 20 feet. So it's dark and scary now there. But I don't think it's from you doing anything. I think it's just from him, you know, I don't know, maybe looking back over me, having second thoughts, and eventually they might come back around. But it's just a chance. I don't think you could do much to a fleeing fish other than stay away. Don't chase it. You could just go and keep on running both of your times. And I think if anything you could do for a fleeing fish is just get down to the sea floor and hope it comes back, comes back around. Yeah, majority of flying fish are not going to come back. Certain species may present another opportunity, like if you see a hogfish run off, like if you start a lot of hogfish, you could probably get another shot on it. Um, sometimes barracudas may like, you could scare one off and it'll go behind a rock and you might get another shot. Same thing with certain snappers and certain groupers may run 20, 30 feet and probably just take cover in a hole. So you won't necessarily get it to turn around, but you could probably get a next opportunity to shoot it. But 99% of fleeing fish, probably not gonna give you another shot. I think if one scenario might be dog snappers in particular, if you see them, if they run inside a hole, then you could you know, probably post up on the side of the hole or, the, or behind of the hole and wait for them. Right. And then you might get a next shot. Yeah. But definitely one tip I'll tell people is if you see like a like you see a big dog snapper go inside of a hole, your first um option shouldn't be to go and stick your head in the hole and try and shoot it. At least try first to get down in a in a spot where the fish can't see you from inside the hole, like you're outside of his line outside because he in the hole looking out. So you don't want to lie down in front of the hole and wait for him to come out. At least go to the side or behind and wait for him first. But don't go, you know, dig around the hole. First thing. It's heavy structure, so the answer to the question is yes. Yes, you do find more fish around wrecks and sunks and reefs and it's because of the structure so they create their own little ecosystems they have holes they have caves where big and small fish can exist they have structures that coral could grow on um, they have current eddies around them so they have a place for fish to hide from current they have a place for fish to stay in current to, to find the passing fish for passing bait fish uh, the coral thrives because they have flowing currents and they have nutrition passing through the water, that kind of stuff. So generally anything that is kind of like large in the water uh, with a lot of flowing, flowing current by it or a lot of caves or holes by it would attract life. Wrecks especially attract life because of they have such big holes. 
So there's a lot of it's not they they only they don't only have life on the outside, but they have life on the inside of them. They're hollow. Kind of tricky. It also, it kind of tricky because I think our answer would be, could potentially be the interest. Because I don't want to, I don't want to see, you know, push it until they start to feel contractions. I, I don't know if for a certain individual that might be too much. It might be too soon. But I would say, you know, try, try and be conservative up front, <clears throat> and slowly. You know, I wouldn't say push yourself, but just inch yourself a little bit more and try and find your limits. You know, very see as safe as they could. I don't want to say, you know, you know, once they start to get contractions, yeah, for ten seconds. I don't, I don't think that's a responsible thing to tell somebody. I think that that quite individual, and they should experiment on their own, but as safe as possible. Because for me, I. I might push further, or maybe not as much as somebody else, and somebody else might get away with with pushing a little bit more than me. But I think everybody different. Yeah, if I could, if I could add on it, I just, I just say it, I agree with that with respect to. I think it's a very personal thing. Limitations are personal. So, as pharaohs, we always want to prioritize safety. So. Initially, you always want to be conservative, and then I guess if you want to push yourself further, you have some dive buddy there that's always going to be watching over you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's a that's a personal limit that you're referring to. I don't think any individual could really give another advice on that. So you have to you have to learn yourself. You have to learn your limits. You have to learn what feels comfortable, and not only feels comfortable but actually is comfortable and safe. Because if you're living outside of that comfort zone and you're pushing yourself hard every day, it's probably gonna end bad for you. So you wanna you wanna only push when you have uh, the proper safety barriers, you know, around with safety divers, or you're doing it in conditions where you know less current, somebody watching you, a boatman close by, a group of people diving with you, you have a dive rope or you know your drop rope or whatever it is that you're going down on. That kind of stuff, but yeah, it's personal. I would, I would probably think. So my most, I don't have a most memorable moment. Probably, I think I'll, I'll probably go more with a most memorable day. Um, where I had a really, really outstanding day of spare fishing and hunting out of Trinidad with uh, Christian Rich Josh Lewis and myself. We had really, really clean water and just no current. Um, had really nice fish on that day. Uh, and some nice Kubera snappers, yellow jacks, dog snappers, black groupers. Um, yeah, so still, still up to this day, I still have some of those videos on my computer. It's, it really was a very, very memorable, amazing day. Um, my most memorable and you didn't ask this question, but I'm going to answer it. Add it on anyway. My most memorable free dive is without doubt in Grenada. I went free diving. Uh, we were fishing for yellowfin tuna and we were passing sperm reels. And I just was like, fellas, I jumped out the boat too. And I just put on my gear and I just jumped out the boat and I swam with a couple of them. So that was cool. If a free dive, even though it was, it would have to be my personal best. Free dive that was last year when and, and, and you were there. That was it, that is, you see him there when I made the one, the 128 in to the ground in um, that was Castara, no, Charlottesville. Styles of fishing, um, st styles of spare fishing is, is personal thing, right? So everybody, just like everybody, has their own personality. Everybody has a different style of, of spare fishing. Everybody tweaks little things. Um, so like I give you an example of the people that I spare fish with and myself. 
because it's it's easy and I and I know how they spare fish. I know I spare fish. So like I am a little bit more uh, assertive and quick with how I dive. So I would be uh, my breathe up times are a little bit shorter than somebody like Christian Reese. So I'm going to compare myself to somebody like Christian Reese. So my breathe up times are a lot shorter than his own. So I would do more dives than he would in a day. My breather times would be shorter. So if we're drifting towards a reef, I would more than likely go, go down before him. And it's only because I want to go down on, a, like I'm very precise with exactly where I want to be on that reef. Uh, he's a little bit more relaxed and laid back with his style of spare fishing. And it continues down to the sea floor. So once you hit the sea floor, I have a lot faster. My scan is much more aggressive compared to his own. So like, if you look at my GoPro footage, if you use that as an example, it'll be very shifty. Now, having that style of hunting and spare, like being a sparrow, I think consumes a lot more um, oxygen and energy. So I think my, it also affects my bottom time. Um, Reese is a fantastic free diver. So he already has like a good breath hole on me and a good free dive on me. But I think his style of diving also adds it. So because his motions are so much slower, he ends up having like longer bottom times, well, even further, you know, um, than what he already does. Also, his percentage of kill shots uh, seems to be higher than my own but my percentage of shot fish seem to be higher than his own. So when I review his footage, I find like he's a lot more patient with his shots and he waits a little bit longer for fish to get a little bit closer to him and present those kill shot opportunities. He has a little bit more discipline than I do, if you want to call it that. Um, whereas I'm a little bit more assertive with taking the trick, um, pulling the trigger, I'm a little bit more aggressive with all right, I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm pulling the trigger now. I'm seeing an opportunity for me to take this fish, and I'm going to take it. Uh, where he would probably, like, be a little bit more patient, maybe, like, five, ten seconds more. And, yeah, he just ends up with a lot more kill shots than I do. But it's interesting diving with different people and seeing their styles. And people do have different styles. Some people are aggressive. Some people hunt slow. Some people dive deep. Some people dive shallow. All that kind of stuff. I can show you a video if I share my screen. Got a TF for y'all. Let me know if y'all seeing it. Okay, yeah, I can see. All right, so this is me doing a dive. Um, so I want you to pay attention to my head movements once I get to the seafloor, like how fast my scan is. So this is my breather. I'm just gonna fast forward it to where I'm actually diving now. All right. So I normally would have my head tucked, but I started seeing fish on the way down already. So you can see the fish off the side and you can see some two bears coming in. And already you can see my scan is moving left and right. Whereas Reese typically keeps his head straight and a lot less Movement. You see how much movement I have on my head? I see how much faster my scan is. So I'm a lot less likely to what I what I've found is that I I'm a, I'm a lot quicker to see fish than he is. So because I'm always looking in different directions and I'm very, very kind of I, I don't know how to describe it, but like just just fast rapid movements. I pick up on fish much faster than he would. And I've seen this in his videos, but like I mentioned before, like he gets fish that get so close to him because he's has such a higher level of patience and he's so much more relaxed. And I've, I've mentioned this before, like if, if I had to trade my ability to shoot more fish to his style of actual free diving, I probably would because I, I think it's way more beneficial to have a good free diving technique than it is to have a good hunting technique. That's my personal opinion. So 
think well, me and Brett would be very well quite different. Not completely opposite, but I think I would be more of what he described Reese would be as in my style is just take a good breed up, take my time, get a good duck dive and tuck my head and tuck my head pretty much all the way down to the ground and and um if anything I would do I just sort sort of um a tool going down and scan if you if you sort of think about it as how a periscope on top of a submarine is look around, I would be doing that upside down on the way down, sort of scanning the, the ground before I actually reach while still keeping my head kinda tucked. And more than likely I will just keep that position and I reach the ground itself and then worry about what around and yeah. And yeah, that's definitely the best way to hunt. For sure. And but most of the time most of the time just, you know, stay in put kinda like um if you were to describe it as being a more of a lazy diver in a way. Is what I would classify myself as. <laughs>